All right, Tampa Native Show fans, we are live here. And this is it's Friday morning. It's 1130-ish. Where else would you be? But here at the Attic Cafe, 500 East Kennedy Boulevard, a stone's throw away from City Hall. We can, it's a beautiful day. We've got audience members. I've got Miss Deborah Belanti here, and she's running for what? Tell us, Deborah. Florida House, District 60. Florida House, District 60. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But we want to welcome everybody back. We missed you last week. Anthony Kovic, our executive producer, our producer, and the man who puts all this together for us was in Orlando at a podcast conference, if you will, learning all about the next generation, the next big wave of podcasts, and he's going to share that with his audience immediately following this show. Thanks, as always, to Rich McIntyre for providing this venue for us right here at the Attic Cafe. Excellent cafe con leche. Come get a snack. Come see the view. Come watch our show. We'll be here for about the next 35 minutes. Deborah, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, this is going to be fast-paced. I've got my questions here for that. All hard-hitting, by the way, <laughs> because that's how we do. That's how we roll up in here, the Tampa Native Show. Okay? So get ready. You're going to get introduced to Deborah in ways that you didn't think were even possible. Deborah, <laughs> let me start off here right up at the top and, and ask you a, the most important question I can possibly ask anybody on the Tampa Native Show. Where did you grow up? And what are some of your favorite memories of your hometown? Hit it. I am a Floridian. Native. I am not a Tampa native, but I'm a Florida native. I grew up in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, and my favorite memories were I was, uh, grew up there when it wasn't as developed. And so um, there were miles between each house and many acres of palm fronds and cows. And I ran barefoot through those with my siblings. We built forts. We picked mangoes, stuck them in the tree, and ate them. Stop it. Um, sugar cane grew in my yard. And you know, Florida gets a bad rap, ladies and gentlemen, you know, because of things that have happened in our history. But really and truthfully, it's a wonderful place, or at least it was, mm -hmm. when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Cannot look away from the fact that Florida has become densely, densely, much more densely populated than ever before, and especially in the area that we live now, which you are going to be representing come November in Tallahassee. Am I right? That's right. Okay. You got your marching orders. Mm -hmm. Look, this next question I have here is, when did you come to live in Tampa? What year did you get here? I came to Tampa in 1993. Mm -hmm. um, I actually went to school in Tallahassee, Florida State. Go Seminoles. There you go, right here. Um, and they make, yep, yep, thank you. And then I, I went to Palm Beach, uh, West Palm Beach, for a few years. Okay. Followed a love in college there, and when that didn't work out, I uh, came Sorry. to... Yep, it's, I'm, I'm not. It happens. <laughs> it happens. Um, I came to Tampa because I had close friends from college that lived here. They're from here. Um, and I, I had visited before and really loved the diversity that Tampa had. It was so different than Palm Beach. Um, and so I decided to move, and I moved in 1993 to Tampa um, and have been here ever since. And I, there is no other town that compares, in my mind, in Florida as Tampa. There you go. You heard it here first. It's kind of the Austin, Texas of Florida, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It has, it has a great music scene, mm -hmm. culturally diverse, with a tremendous history, and I think that gets overlooked a lot of the ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're at a little bit of a crossroads right now. Our identity is kind of under assault, right? Because they want to they wanna force this amalgam on us, this Tampa Bay amalgam on us. But, hey, we're pushing back. That's why we do the Tampa Native Show. That's why we have representatives like Deborah, that have come here from someplace else, see what it means to us to be a Tampeño, right, Tampa native, and embracing it for all it's worth. 25 mm -hmm. years. I mean, that's a generation, right? That's, that's a complete generation. And, as, I've, and I've made my home here, and my daughter is now a Tampa native. Here we go. And, Where's uh, my bell? Yeah, ding, ding. She is, and she thrives here. Our school systems are wonderful. Uh, the fact that we can bike and walk to any of the restaurants in town, and the fact that they're independent restaurants, we don't have all the box, big name restaurants all over the place. That's what keeps us here. Uh, the fact that my husband and I both can own our own businesses and thrive, that's what keeps us here. Um, you know, he's a surfer. We're hikers. He's a mountain biker. And yes, you can mountain bike in Tampa. That's what keeps us here. They're little mountains, but you can mountain bike <laughs> here in Tampa. I'm just saying. I mean, if you've seen mountains, yeah. you know what no, Deborah's saying. You have to take it with a little, you know, tongue in cheek. But yeah, no, there's elevations and there are places to ride. You have to be careful, right? Because of the traffic and that's, an, that's for another conversation. Mm -hmm. What do you remember, your first favorite restaurant in Tampa? And, you know, with so many new restaurants, as you just alluded mm -hmm. to opening up, 
how, how has that changed over the years? Wow, it's, well, what's amazing is I, I love independent restaurants, and I'll be the first to try them. Um, and I have a college roommate who actually started Chicho and Tony's here in town. There you go. And uh, they, little of course, a little shout-out to, to, shout to Jeff Gigante and Jimmy Lanza at Chicho and Tony. Their restaurant group has, has boomed and blossomed. And, um, and this is a gentleman who grew up in St. Pete and went to school in Tallahassee and went to New York and waited tables at the restaurant Chicho's in New York and said this would work in Tampa. And he talked the owners to come down and open it here. And now you see what they've become. Right. Um, and they are one of my they are my, my favorite restaurants to follow. But I love Italian food. So Cafe Paradiso, Paolo Tini, that is my favorite Italian restaurant by far. Um, I love everything that they do. Um, but really anywhere that's local and I know the owners, I like to frequent. We have become, whether it's by default or whether it's with intention sort of a foodie city, right? Yep. We went from being Cigar City with our history to now, I don't know, where we're morphing into something that is, I think, across the nation, uh, being regarded as one of the food-centric cities yep. in America. Yep. Um, what do you do for a living? And your husband. Tell us, give us uh, 411 on what you do for a living. Right. Well, we're both self-employed. We both okay. own our own businesses. Okay. I, my husband's a property appraiser, and he built his... He moved here for me from another city, from Jacksonville, and had to start his business from scratch and build it back up and is doing wonderful. I own a marketing business, marketing okay. firm. So mm -hmm. I'm a consultant to large organizations and small little restaurants. So um, we both have been able to um, gainfully be self-employed uh, and made it through the recession, which some people didn't get to do, um, and, uh, and are both thriving and enjoy the flexibility that being your own boss. And so I hear self-starter. Self-starter. I hear self-sufficient. Yep. I hear somebody that's got the the, the chops and uh, and the polit and the will to, to maybe do what needs to be done mm -hmm. in Tallahassee. Listen, that's not a, that's not an easy that's not an easy slog. I mean, that's yeah. you got to you got to be able to give as good as you get and uh, and and in fight because you know you can't just stay outside and and play around with right. it. So uh, right. I'm I'm glad that uh, she's giving you the opportunity. Deborah's giving you the opportunity to see what she's made of. Right. Uh, I hear and you mentioned your daughter earlier that your daughter uh, is a bit of a, an athletic savant. Can, can I say that? I mean, yeah. she's, she's achieved certain uh, heights athletically. Tell us about that. Well, uh, she started skateboarding when she was about five or six with her father, who is also a skateboarder. Uh, we actually have a half pipe in our backyard. Um, and okay, we, we need to explain oh, what a half, half pipe is. Oh, it's, not a crack, it's not a crap <laughs> pipe. Okay. That's right. It's not a sewer pipe. No, it's a... But we are watching the Olympics now, so maybe people will know right. what a half it's pipe is. Right. It's very similar to what snowboarders there use. You it's, go. it's two quarter pipes put together, and it becomes this half. huge half pipe. Two quarters and a half. Uh, right. And, uh, and she's amazing. She would go anywhere with her skateboard and drop in on places, you know, height from heights that most adults couldn't do. Um, and she's also a flag football player and a pretty good one. She's the only girl in her, the entire division of the third and fourth grade. Um, and she's pretty much a phenom and I think uh, anything she gets on oh, she's now mountain biking with her father um, so we're, we're just very blessed by her spirit of wanting to do and try new things needless to say the first girl child student pick at PE when you break up she's probably the team captain let's just put yeah, it that yeah, way probably. I, would, I would think yeah. that she would be the team yeah. captain yeah. that's great and the fact that you know that's not easy to do mm -hmm. okay skateboarding is, is an acquired skill mm -hmm. that requires not only daring do but you got to have a tremendous sense of balance, spatial. I mean, it's we, we're watching. We're watching right now the Olympics. Yeah. And um, yeah. I don't know how. Well, you got to start when you're. How old was your daughter when she started? Five six. Five six. Yeah. Well, um, I also hear uh, that you're the artist of one of Florida's most iconic pieces of art, seen by millions of people every day. Mm -hmm. Is is this something that you can tell us about? Yeah, it's actually the, the state of Florida tag. It was not the one that we have now with the one orange, but the, um, I'm sorry, the one with the two orange. It was the one previous years. It was the one single orange. And how that came about was... Stem and leaf. The stem, one, stem, one, one orange, leaf. one leaf. Yes. I remember. Uh, and it was for 10 years, because they change it every 10 years. Okay. Um, and Lawton Childs was our governor. And the Department of Citrus uh, really wanted to get an orange, as they should, since they were number one, you know, one of, one of the number one industries in our state. And they went to New York City to hire an agency to help them do this. And everything that came down from the New York agency, the governor said, no, I don't like it, rejected everything. So he got a hold of me, he called me up, and we met maybe for an hour, and he said, here's my problem. I said, well, let's make some designs. So we made some designs, we sent four up to the governor, and just a side note, the governor's wife happened to be a, an artist. So um, Lawton brought him home, all the designs home, and showed the, the wife, and the wife said, well, I like these. 
So they took four designs and presented them to the cabinet. Three of the designs presented were mine. So I had a pretty good chance they were going to pick one. I yeah, mean, they were going to. If you gonna, didn't get it, we yeah, have a problem. Right. a problem. Right. So and they picked it. So it was, um, it was, it was quite a feat. I, I was just, I had just moved to Tampa. It was like 1996. Um, Big feather in your cap. Yep. I put, in, put my name out. People knew who I was. I was interviewed by Gail Sirens, uh, designing women's series that she had back then, and uh, it was pretty. It made my mom and dad proud. So well, it was, of course it was it pretty would. good. Nice I, bragging rights. I'm sure. Yeah, G nice Gail bragging Karen's rights. another Tampa native yep. of note, yep. right? Yep, another Seminole. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> it says here, you're an active member of some civic organizations and mm -hmm. some charitable organizations. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the efforts that have led you down that path. Well, I've always been uh, big about giving back. Uh, my parents were public servants in, in the volunteer capacity. Uh, we've always... Uh, Salvation Army is one of the ones that I grew up learning and knowing about and they were disaster relief volunteers and we all served at the soup kitchens before we ate our Thanksgiving dinners. So I always knew that it was important that we gave back. And so as soon as I got here, I was young and I was single and I had a lot of time on my hands. So I jumped into every charitable group that I knew. Uh, I served on the board of the American Cancer Society. I chaired their Cattle Barons Ball, which as you know is one of the bigger fundraisers in town. Uh, I also volunteered for St. Joseph's Hospital and Tampa General Hospital, and I chaired both of their galas, uh, both twice. Um, I chaired uh, the after party uh, for the young people at the Tampa Museum of Art, which <laughs> the year they hired a huge orchestra to play, they all left to come listen to the band that I got for free at the after party, and they were jumping up and down, so they were a little mad about that. But um, uh, I've always just thought of, of giving back. And even before, you know, a lot of people start volunteering after something has happened, like someone gets cancer in their family and then you started helping. Well, I had none of those things. I just knew I had the time and the ability to do something. And so I, I've raised a good bit of money for town um, from those efforts. And I got other people involved, which is probably more important to me than anything else. It didn't hurt that you got good uh, indoctrination early mm -hmm. from your parents who mm -hmm. taught you the value of public service. Right. And I think that's something that we could consider, you know, uh, in, in this environment today as, as politicized as most everything is, mm -hmm. and as divisive as all, all of it is, you know, even the term politician has, has now a negative connotation. Right. So from here, henceforth, uh, they're only going to be referred to as public servants. That's right. Unless you're on the other side, and then we'll call you a politician. I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding I, because I can. But really and truthfully, it is public service. And unless you're willing to step into that and own that and, and, and live that, walk that walk and talk that talk, I don't know that it's for everybody, right? But it's public not. service doesn't it make you feel good when you, you know, when you're involved like that. Yeah, well, I get energized, and I've always got energized by talking to people about things that we care about as a group, as right. as humans. Right. So that's why that's why people feel good when they give to the Humane Society. That's why they feel good at Christmas when they put the, the coins in the kettles. We know the that. Army. You know you feel good. Yeah. So as a public servant and someone running for office, I feel good when I talk to people in my district about what they care about, and I I, I empathize with them. I get, uh, I get more energy from them when I see that they're as passionate as I am. District 60. District 60. Let's talk about District 60. Just real quick, going off script for a second, District 60 encompasses what part of the town? Um, anything south of Kennedy, so 60, Highway 60, all the way south. It actually goes a little bit up into town and country, Racetrack Road, but it goes all the way down, uh, everything west of 41 to Apollo Beach and Ruskin. Basically, the entire district is bordered by water, and I can actually see every constituent by boat if I wanted to. Yes, you can. Yeah. And if and you I ride may. up into and the I fingers may. there, you can see a lot yeah. of constituents yeah. with big boats mm -hmm. right there in that part mm -hmm. of town. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's quite a well-heeled community, mm -hmm. as, it, as it were. That's the mystic crew of Gasparilla it territory, is, is it not? the mystic crew of Gasparilla. Maybe I can borrow their pirates. Well, ship. how are you going to break into that? What, what are you going to do uh, to attract attention away from the lady that's currently uh, in the seat that you wish to occupy? Well, I think the biggest thing <clears> is getting out the vote, which is important for every candidate and every race um, all the way down the ballot. Yes. Um, I think midterms are always a struggle uh, to get people out to vote, and I think that's important. And how I'm going to do that is I am talking to business owners as a business owner and, and let them understand that what uh, it's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It is a what's the best interest for Tampa, Tampa. and I want to do what's best for Tampa. Um, you know, I care about our development, but I want it to be smart. Um, I, I don't want us to raise taxes unless I know what it's going to. I want us to be efficient with what we're doing with our dollars. Um, we care about public education in Tampa. Boy Everybody do does. Boy do Everybody does. And even if your child goes to parochial school or private school, you want people educated properly, and we can't do that without proper funding. 
So I, what I'm speaking to, to people I talk to, are things that they do care about. So um, I think I'll make an impact because I, I know the policy, I can talk um, about the bills that are in Tallahassee, right. and I actually have some ideas on, how, uh, on ways for us to do some things. So, um, and I also, I'm not afraid to talk to people and knock on doors and ask for money. So That's the key, yeah. because in public service, it's all about the ask. Mm -hmm. It's all about the ask. You've got to ask for the charitable donations, and even more importantly, you've got to ask for the vote. Yes. Because without that, That's right. mission not accomplished. That's right. So you're now announced candidate for District 60. Yep. I think you mentioned why you're running. Yep. Is there anything that you left out? Oh, gosh. Well, a big subject that happened this week is uh, gun control. Yeah. Um, we, and can and we can talk about that. We can talk about that a little got bit? Some, we've got okay. some time. I think that it would be okay. uh, derelict. Right. If we didn't bring it up, right. it's, it's on everybody's mind. Um, and, and I think, again, here goes to our politicians, let's use that word, who, uh, who want to draw a divisive line between Democrats and Republicans. Um, and it shouldn't be there. This should be a nonpartisan issue. This is our children's safety. When the second most place that they should be safe is their school, and they're no longer safe, both sides of the aisle should be pretty upset about that. Right. And finding some ways to address it. Mental illness, yes, it's part of the problem, but it's not the problem. And I don't know of anybody doing anything to address that either. So my hope is that I can get some people on both sides of the aisle to actually stop being partisan and doing something to save our children. We are in a position, uh, I, I think, that becomes more and more unique each and every week in our country, where we have become somewhat desensitized to these horrible situations that crop up seemingly more frequently and uh, and and you know we, we we tend to all go into our, our quiet space uh, and and of course those of us that are on social media come out with the uh, thoughts and prayers uh, response but I think that we're in a point now where thoughts and prayers are just not sufficient right. just not getting it done who among us man or woman Republican Democrat no matter party affiliation is going to have the uh, uh, the wherewithal, the moxie, right, the fortitude to stand up tall and take this on. Right. I can't imagine, and I don't have any grandchildren yet. My uh, sons are, are grown uh, and grown men and adults. But I'm not encouraging either one of them to have children. And I know I'd be a great grand, a great period grandfather, uh, grandfather, right? Not great grandfather. Grand. I know I'll be a good one. But maybe not today. And maybe not so much. When we went to school, when we were kids, I'll be 60 this year, so you do the math in the early 60s throughout the 70s. Man, it was the worst thing that happened was maybe you had a fight on the playground. I didn't even, who, who knew the vernacular active shooter was nothing that we ever, and then you watch the interviews that, with, with the students that lost their playmates and their classmates two days ago on Valentine's Day, and you realize their lives have been altered forever their families it's just how did we get here but even more importantly how are we going to fix it you got some definitive answers for us i don't have definitive answers but i think that i think we need to start looking at solutions and and other states are doing some things that florida just hasn't done for one state there's a bill in, in four states now that lets family members if they feel their their child or spouse or a fa any family member is um, mentally uh, ill or suicidal they actually can Baker Act of sorts and get their guns taken away from them temporarily. Um, and that is in place in some states. And why don't we consider that? See something, and say something. See something, see something. something right, say something. Right. And, and, I, and to the point where there are some people who will say, well, you're going to take all of our guns. We don't want to take all your guns. We want to take away the guns that are these assault rifle, rifle type yeah. that no one needs unless you're in the military. Right. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I, I, listen, you're preaching to the choir. I'm, I'm, I'm on your side of this argument. I know it's not an easy one because there are, you know, dissenting voices on both sides. Right. But something needs to be done because the situation has become untenable. And I think much like the union worker that was working the auto assembly line that all he did all day long was turn that one wrench, turn that one screw, you know, that, that knot in your stomach, it doesn't go away at night because you realize this is your reality each and every day. Well, we all have to get to the point where this is our reality each and every day. And, and it, we are there now. Right. It breaks my heart because my daughter is nine and she's in elementary school. She's at Mitchell Elementary, wonderful school. And they have shelter in place is the drill they do. Come on now. 
My daughter's job is to turn off the lights. Kids turn off the lights, they run behind the teacher's desk. Um, I don't think that's a place we want any of our children growing up in, and, and uh, I, someone needs to do something, and we need to elect people who care enough to do something about it. Well, and, that's, and we'll leave that right there. We'll just <laughs> let that kind of settle right there because we are all just reeling right now. If you have any kind of a sense of who you are in the community, if you feel, if you have children, if you, if you love kids, whether you have children or not, uh, safety, their safety should be paramount. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult enough going to school with all the peer pressure and, try, and trying to perform <laughs> under that kind of pressure with also having to look out the window to wonder if today is the day. Mm -hmm. So I'm tickled. I mean, can you mention your opponent's name here now so everybody knows who you're going to be taking on? Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Jackie Toledo. There you go. She's, uh, she's the incumbent. She, it's her first term. Um, and she's actually proposed some bills that I don't agree with and many people in Tampa don't agree with. Right. Um, so I'm here to, to, I hope she shows up to debate. I'd love to talk to her about the reasons behind some of the things she's done. We'll see. Um, but I'm ready to actually have the right representation for Tampa and Tallahassee. I think there should be a rule in place. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that motion on the floor right now. Public opinion, the court of public opinion, if you don't show up for a debate, you don't show up for a debate. You forfeit your right to run for that political position. That political I love office. that. I think that's okay? fantastic. Because if we all remember what happened on the uh, last iteration of the Tampa Native Show when Mr. Guido Maniscalco, whose office is about uh, 200 yards that way, was running against Ms. Jackie Toledo, and yours truly got caught in the ringer there and was villainized by the, some of the media because I was partial. And, and I had set up a debate between the two, and Jackie chose not to show up. And 155 votes difference is what cost her her seat. Now, I hate the term failing up or forward, but she didn't win a, a city council seat, yet she won a seat, I mean, an even bigger seat that is typically the progression. I don't know how that happened. I don't know, because, I'm, look, I'm, I'm the host of this meager Tampa Native Show podcast now. That would be like tomorrow, I'm anchoring the CBS Evening News. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, wh where's my street cred there? But what were you going to say, Deborah? Well, I think that, that w she worked her, I think she learned her lesson from that Sunday Council race and worked her butt off, if I can say butt. You can um, say butt. To it's a podcast. She, she, you can uh, say worse than that. <laughs> she, she worked hard. And I'll, I'll give her the credit that she worked hard. Um, she actually wasn't even the candidate that that Republican Party wanted. Mm -hmm. um, they actually had a really credible candidate, but she worked her butt off and she and she earned uh, the primary race. Um, but I, I think that this time people have seen that she is not voting even the way she believes. She's actually very hypocritical um, because people who know her personally know that she doesn't believe the way that she votes, and I have a problem with that as well. Um, you know, get a spine, vote the way Tampa wants you to vote. Be authentic. Be authentic. I, I, listen. You can say what you will about our current situation in Washington, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and I have my opinions, as I'm sure a lot of you do there as well. But the man believes that what he says and does is right. He's being authentic. We can debate all day long whether that authenticity is dangerous or, or in some ways unhinged, but he's authentic. We know who he is. Be authentic. Be authentic. You're going to go into public service, say what you mean, and mean what you say, and then go to work. Mm -hmm. Go to work. That's all. Hey, do we have any questions from the audience today? We've got some lovely audience members here. Anybody have a question? Do we show a show of hands? I'll make a question up. I'll give you the question if you need a question. Ladies? Yeah, there you go. Get, grab the microphone, uh, and, uh, and please, just, uh, you're not going to be on camera, but you can, uh, you can at least, uh, yeah, do we? Um, just wondered about uh, the importance of funding public education, and if you can address that's, that. That's a, an absolutely perfect question, because public education, how important is that? It's very important, and even, even going back to the mental illness issue, I mean, we, you take away funding to schools, and there goes the social workers and guidance counselors that you need. So it all comes back to who's in Tallahassee and who's providing the funds for their schools. Um, is the current bill 7055, uh, which is an omnibus bill that uh, Speaker of the House Richard Corcoran packed a bunch of things into, mm -hmm. and then tied it to passing the budget, which is crazy. Even the senators in uh, the House, or the senators, actually said this was the wrong way to do it. Um, but previous to that, it was House Bill 7069, which um, basically is detrimental to all of us, not just those who go into public schools, because as we know, our public schools are the centers of our communities. 
and they are providing a future for the next generation. And if we don't fund the schools, we're not getting the right teachers there and uh, the academics there, we're not going to have the next workforce that's going to make us keep growing and keep being the successful city that we are. We, we are only as viable and we are only as good as we take care of those mm -hmm. who are the least among us. Okay, right. I mean, this is, and it all, everything's local. All politics is local. Yep. I mean, you, you, you got to go from school board to city council to county commission to state legislature to national government. It, but it, 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 it all starts local. You mentioned Richard Corcoran. I think he's the gentleman that's running ads now that every time I see them on TV, I want to throw something really heavy and, and dense at my flat screen, but I don't because I pay good money for that flat screen. <laughs> but he's talking about Florida over his dead body will become a sanctuary state. End of story. And he leaves it off with a woman who apparently is, is shot point blank in the face by, what, an immigrant or somebody who's here illegally, an illegal? So this is how nasty it is. This is how nasty it's become. I don't think it needs to be that way. Mm -hmm. I think, Deborah, you represent the best among us. I think if you're getting a sense of what Deborah's sharing with you guys, it's, a, it's an organic desire to make our hometown a better place. Yeah. It wasn't her hometown originally, but she's adopted it now, and her daughter was born here, so Tampa's home. You notice she didn't say Tampa Bay. <laughs> she's got my vote. <laughs> but that's something that you, you need to listen to and you need to pay attention to because it's very, very important. You keep, the, you keep the focus right here, you know? You don't see all of this distraction out here. You keep the focus right here and make sure that you take care of the people that put you where you need to be moving forward. She didn't say anything about it, and I can't wait to be a representative of District 60 so that I can parlay that into becoming the next Kathy Castro. She didn't say that at all. And that's admirable because, listen, man, you've got, you, you, you know, you, you got to win a few games here at home before you can go on the road, before you can even talk about winning a championship. We also need to build the bench. Um, I think what we don't do well is... Athletic we, term. Yeah. Tell everybody bench. what that means, right? That means we need to get more people in line. Up. Load that pipeline. Yes, grow the pipeline. Um, and then show people that to not be afraid of running for office because they're afraid of the money. Um, I think that... Um, Bernie Sanders showed us that we don't need that corporate that's money. That's right. So uh, building the bench is important and being transformative instead of being transactional. I want someone else to follow my footsteps and keep up the good fight. Say that again because there's your bumper sticker. <laughs> Say it again. Uh, I want people to follow my footsteps because... Before that, I want people to be trans... <laughs> Transformational, not transactional. There I, is. I want people to... You got that? Yes. I want us to be able to, to make a difference. I in see the your campaign behind. manager writing something down over there. <laughs> Listen, you can use it. Just buy me lunch down the road, but I think that's wonderful. And I think that needs to be remembered. Yes. Are we, are we almost out of time, time, guys? We're right there? Oh, yeah. we're right there? Okay, good. Um... Anything that, I mean, you know, you can brag on your husband, you can brag, I mean, this is your time mm. to talk about your family, your parents, whatever didn't get said earlier in the, in the question and answer, in the Q&A. Is there um, anything you'd like to say? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but. Well, I think I'm going to brag about the city. Um, there you I, go. I think that, uh, you know, Florida gets a bad rap all the time, and Tampa does too. Um, and and I, think, I think that we need to start promoting all the things that are great about Tampa. Um, our businesses, um, our, our nature, our landscape, um, the fact that we are developing and hopefully doing smart development, where we're not ruining up our coast, you know, our lines, and our, our water, and all that good stuff. Our um, resources. Our resources. That are right, limited. Right. And, and I, finite. And I love that the, the businesses that are here, many of them, really care about us and are trying to, to do things to help us grow responsibly. Um, and I'm hoping that we get more people in our county commission and city council who think the same way. And, uh, and we can really keep promoting the city and, and grow it the way that we all want it to grow. Um, because I'm not leaving, and and I, my daughter probably and your won't either. Still young. Yeah, she's your still, still not here for a while, and, and we she doesn't want us to sell her house ever. So well, um, she's got a half pipe in her backyard. She's got a half pipe in the backyard. Why would you want to sell your house <laughs> if the thing you love most is in your backyard? That's right. And it's not like you can just deconstruct that and right. you know move. That. Right, right. So just keep promoting Tampa the way that you have. I really appreciate that that you've done thank that. You, and, thank you, Deborah. And and thank you for having me on the show. Of course. Uh, look, I want to leave everybody with this thought. Okay. Um, I do this show each and every week because I have a dear friend, Anthony Kovic, who allows me to come in here and do this. And it doesn't matter where you come from or, or what side of the debate you kind of line up or fall on. But one thing we can all agree on is that we really need to come together in ways that, you know, those two the, the concentric circles that overlap, you've got to find that middle ground because 
if we don't start to put a plan into action to make our city all that it can be, then we're not, we're, not, we're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. It's multifaceted, it's multi-pronged. We've got we to deal with the transportation issues. We've got to deal with the security of our kids in school. All the things that, that Deborah mentioned. But stay plugged in. Stay concerned and, and don't wander, okay? Stay close. I just want to say, look, Deborah, just like myself, this cup of cafe con leche is half full, if you know what I'm saying to you, okay? Yeah. And I believe she feels that way, too. <laughs> That's important. That's important. Um, on behalf of everybody, once again, we are at 500 Kennedy, West Ken East Kennedy Boulevard, but don't East Kennedy Boulevard. I knew that. Rich McIntyre, thank you so much for providing us with this wonderful opportunity to, to come to you each and every week. Anthony, thanks for putting the show together, as always, to our studio audience for being so generous, and, of course, to Ms. Deborah Belanti. We hope that you consider supporting her because she's got a lot of good things to say and do. As we do each and every week on the show, we say salud and happy day. We love you, Tampa, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Gideon. Thank, Thank you, you Deborah.